Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. And today we're looking at Rainbow Force. It's an archetype that I thought I'd never be profiling again, but it made a few people turn their heads uh, after a few League Cup results in America, as well as making one top 32 placement in the Bremen Regional Championships. I actually got to play against this deck. Um, I personally got unfortunate against it, but I saw it was being able to defeat some quite good players and archetypes. So I thought it would be worth revisiting with the main concept of the deck still being what it's always been, uh, reaching high damage output on a non-EX Pokemon and trying to win prize races in that regard. So let's jump into the archetype. It should be fairly familiar at this point. It's always sort of floated around the sort of rogue tier, never really reached too many heights. I remember, I think at the last, last year's uh, London Intercontinentals, there was some hype around it, but it would never really got a huge amount of play and it seems to be in that category once again but it does pose a threat in the format as well as a big one hit KO machine basically. So Xerneas is a 120 HP basic Pokemon uh, that has two attacks. The first is the one that we're really concerning ourselves with. For a fairy and a double colorless we deal 10 base and 30 more damage for each different type of Pokemon on our bench. Now we do have the dual types from Steam Siege that you'll be seeing in a moment. These of course count for 60 damage for each single bench slot. So in theory, we can max out having one zone on the bench uh, and then three of our dual typers, which is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 2, 10. Uh, so that's four bench slots taken up by one, two, three, four Pokemon. And the fifth bench slot can be either Orangaroo or uh, Tapu Lele for an extra 30 and then a 10 base on top. So in theory, we're one-shotting pretty much everything in our path especially when you think about the choice bands and the Potowns that we play as well in the deck. So we really are a big glass cannon. 120 HP isn't actually a great number right now. Uh, so expect this guy to get response KO'd fairly frequently, but who cares? We're taking two prizes in the process and the opponent is having to keep up trading on uh, one prize Pokemon, which is the whole idea. And we're just gonna try and race for prizes to win the game. It does have power creation, which does 80 and 80 more if you were healed. We have no means of healing in the deck, so pretty much just focus on Rainbow Force. Resistance to Dark isn't too relevant. Weakness to Metal also not very relevant. Um, metal Gross would one-shot us anyway, and that's the most impactful Metal type in the game. So there we go. Um, just a big old attack is why we have Xerneas in the deck. So let's have a look at the partners. First of all, we're going to look at the Volcanian EX, simply in here because it is a basic Pokemon that has dual typing. So it acts as a nice 60 damage, just chilling on the bench. We are then going to follow suit with some more dual typers in here. We're going to play a 2-2 line of the Bisharp. Bisharp counting as dark and metal, which is very good for us. But not only is he going to sit on the bench, he can also join in the fun with his attack Retaliate for a single colorless energy, dealing 30. And if any of your Pokemon were knocked out uh, by damage from your opponent's attack last turn, we deal an additional 60. So that is 90 damage. For a single energy, that's fairly efficient. I've just said that Xerneas gets knocked out fairly frequently in response uh, by pretty much almost every deck in the format. So having a single attachment to start combating them in return is always going to be good. With Potown, that 90 becomes a much better number, so we can retaliate on things like Garbodors, which is pretty big. And the most important thing, again, with Choice Band and Potown activation, you can actually one-hit KO Gardevoir GXs. Uh, so that is pretty crazy doing that for a single energy people have tried to tech Bishop into a few things now myself included um, And here seems to be the most natural fit because when he's against anything other than Guardi He's still 60 damage that sits on the bench and retaliate can two shot things as well We're already playing DCs so Lele can help two shot if you have a retaliate in there as well So um, he just make sure you can keep ticking over with attacks. It's not easy to chain attacks with Xerneas themselves uh, it requires hitting of max elixirs or something like EXP share activating a lot of the time because of the nature of its attacks. So having Retaliate in here as an option to keep pressuring the opponent is pretty important and its typing is still great against Guardi. Bear in mind it has resistance because of the part dark typing. So we do need both Choice Band and Potown to have worked once in order to get the one hit KO, but it can work out for you. So Bisharp, pretty cool option. Definitely improves your Guard of War matchup, and in every other case, he's good damage on the bench. We're going to play a 2-1 line of Galvantula. Uh, Joltik's actually a pretty good starter because it has free retreat, so that's really nice for you. And just the one Galvantula, I prefer having a thicker line of the Bishop because it can help out Guardi, which is a more relevant matchup than Galvantula, 
who helps out the Greninja matchup with its attack double thread, dealing 30 to 2 of your opponent's benched Pokemon only. Uh, that has, of course, been errated. It says on the actual card, 2 of your opponent's Pokemon, but um, it has been changed to only benched Pokemon. But we do apply weakness and resistance. This is a crucial element of Galvantula because it means we can now one-hit KO two Frokies at once, or a Froakie and a Staryu, and really pressurize them from the early turns, whilst again having attachments on more important, more important Pokemon on the bench, uh, things like Xerneas for the future turns when they start getting into Greninja's. So Galvantula is a very nice, annoying Pokemon for Greninja to deal with, whilst once again at the same time being a nice dual typer, and the Joltik's a great basic to have in the deck because it can be a pivot throughout the game as well. So uh, I like the 2-1 line in this regard. Then we are going to play one Orangaroo. As is commonplace in many aggressive decks, we are going to have him chilling on the bench for the instructability, allowing us to draw until we have three in our hand. Oftentimes we're digging for things like Energy Guzma or even things like Choice Band or extra Pokemon if we're scrabbling for a little bit of extra damage to push us over the top. Orangaroo can help us get there when we are end to a low hand size. He also has the attack Psychic. 60 plus 20 more for times the amount of energy attached to your opponent's active. I've already mentioned how Bishop can help two-shot things. Orangaroo can also similarly function in that regard because we are, again, playing max elixirs. So even Psychic is an option for you, which is pretty cool. And we're going to round it off with just two Tapu Lele GX. Um, there's no reason to play more because you can't physically bench more without hurting your own damage output. So there are matchups where you can put down multiple Leles, but you have to be concerned about your uh, damage cap the entire game. So bear this in mind, we don't play more simply because we won't physically ever want to bench more than two Lele in almost every matchup. So its ability is of course great, we don't have any other psychics in the deck, so we are going to benefit from Wonder Tag and also have the energy drive available, but unlike in other decks, two is pretty much the maximum count you can have uh, in a Rainbow Force list. So this is, makes it a fairly budget option to be honest, you can get away with even one Tapu Lele. I've, some, I've seen some lists trying to go for that approach, so... If you are a fairly newer player, Rainbow Force can be uh, one of the nicer budget decks if you only have access to one Lele. Let's look at the items now. I'm going to play one Stretcher and one Super Odd. Uh, recovering energy and any sort of Pokemon is great. Stretcher a bit more immediate as well for getting you know that extra Bisharp back or an extra Xerneas. Uh, one of the things that's very important is to try and stream attackers whenever possible. Uh, so having the Stretcher for the immediate effect is going to be nice. Having the Rod is nice for resetting things like Max Elixirs as well later on in the game for uh, extra Xerneas to keep attacking. So I like the split. Going to have one Nest Ball. It's just a cheeky one of that I decided to put in because I've just mentioned how important it is to maintain Xerneas on the board. You typically attack with one while setting up one on the bench. And then the rest of your bench is filled with not like junk Pokemon, but they're there for the damage output and rarely ever get involved in the attacking. Um, so uh, it's really important to keep accessing Xerneas throughout the game. And Nest Ball helps us do that as well as be an option in the early turns to get you even like a Ranguru to draw you out of a dead hand or just get more damage on the board in general. A very cool card for getting um, Volcanium EX in particular because we can bridge it for almost everything else in the deck. It's only a Volk that's like the difficult to search card now that we've gone away from the Hooper engine that used to be played because of course Shaman EX is now rotated as has a bunch of other of the good EX Pokemon that were previously options for Xerneas. So, following on from that, we are going to play 4 Ultra Ball, the consistency card as we all know. 2 Potown in here, you wouldn't think that this deck needs help damaging things, but uh, this is integral for, as I said, the Bisharp to 1 hit KO Guardies, which makes that matchup as good as it is. Uh, it also helps out against things like Metagross, which really is tanky, um, forcing them to heal off like 30 damages with max potions can help you later down the line as well. Resource-wise, it really hurts them, so Potown good against all these things. Uh, good against even things like um, Espeon GX because they play Parallel Cities. If you can maybe get a Potown activation on um, Espeons, of course their own ability gets around it anyway, but if they have Garbodors, they still have to manually evolve up at times. So Potown can get extra chip damages on things like Galissapods, things like Espeons to make your life a little bit easier for getting those one-hit KOs. So Potown is going to be nice, and at the same time it counters things like Parallel City, which is a stadium that we don't want to be in play for too long. So I like the double Potown, mainly in here for the Guardi matchup, but can help out in general for helping you ramp to one-hit KOs a little bit less uh, awkwardly, which is pretty nice. We are then going to play one of Bridget. It's a very nice early game option, as we've found out in pretty much every deck these days. Lele for Bridget, get, grab yourself some Xerneas, get your relevant attackers or relevant um, bench sitters. 
get a Ranga as well to keep drawing very nice one of, as we've seen in plenty of decks. Just one N, um, really, this is because of the nature of Rainbow Force. I've always found that Rainbow Force never wants to play N because you don't get yourself enough cards because you've gone aggressive in the early turns. N becomes like a shuffle draw four, shuffle draw three. That really sucks. So I'm only playing one because we can still uh, disrupt our opponent at some point in the game. We can still prevent something like a beacon. We can prevent something like a magical ribbon, which is important in a couple of archetypes. But in general, you want to move on from N and start going more aggressive with your other supporters. Sycamore to dig a little bit harder or Guzma to make sure you're taking two prize knockouts. So just the one count of N is a little bit risky, uh, but I feel overall for the deck and how it tries to function the momentum is all about how we win really we need momentum on our side to keep chugging through and keep taking these massive one hit knockouts and doesn't really help you do that whereas the other supporters that we play do a much better job that is indeed why we are playing four copies of lily lily can be a good turn one play if you don't need to bridge it or if your hand is awkward and you uh, don't want to bridge it you need to find yourselves like energy attachments and stuff Lily can be a good early game play, and unlike N, it gains value when uh, you are being end by your opponent down to a low hand size. Lily can then top you back up to a nice healthy six card hand. And with a Ranguru support as well in there, you could go from Instruct, play a few more cards. Lily helps you dig a lot. So um, I prefer this to N. Um, maybe like a 3 2 counter is a bit more safe, a bit more traditional, but with my list, I'm making a statement that I want to be as aggressive as possible, and Lily can help us do that. We're going to play Sycamore as well for the aggressive draw. Uh, we all know why Sycamore is in every deck pretty much. And we're going to round it off with four copies of Guzma, the highest count possible. Because I've just mentioned that we are trying to Grinch down the opponent as aggressively as possible. Rainbow forcing on two prize Pokemon, always going to be our option if we are able to take it. So that is very nice. And when you play double Joltik as well, you don't have to be too concerned about retreating out. And we're playing two Floatstone as well, so we can normally jump between our attackers quite efficiently. I don't have to worry about the quote-unquote downside of Guzma, the additional effect of switching our own Pokemon. We should be able to navigate that fairly frequently um, whilst being able to track down as many two prizes as possible to fin finish the game as quickly as possible. Onto the tools, we are playing one copy of EXP Share. I'd kind of want to work in an extra one, um, but I feel Choice Band is actually a pretty important card if you're trying to put down things like Orangaroo and Lele's and such. Um, trying to put down as few double... Um, typers as possible uh, to get benefits from you know the things with good abilities Lele's, Orangaroos, getting your Xerneas in play um, that's pretty much allowed thanks to choice band so I'm choosing to go for a heavier choice band route just keeping the 1 EXP share in here because you know everyone's playing field blower but it forces people to find an extra card and when people are trying to end to disrupt our side of the board they're drawing a lot less cards than other options so maybe they can't find their field blowers you only really need it to stick for one turn and then you have another Xerneas set up and you're in great shape. It can also sit on a Lele or an Orangaroo and still serve a pretty decent purpose. So it's an insta-play card that you can almost always put down on the board. Um, but a lot of the time Choice Band is important for our own numbers. So I don't want to go much higher than this. We're going to play two floats. I've said it's important for Guzma plays. It, we can put it on Orangaroo and uh, Volcanion, some of our more chunky Pokemon. Yeah, or just in general, clap it down wherever you want so you can protect yourself and have your uh, Guzma target, which is always nice. And then we are going to play three choice band, as I just mentioned. Very nice um, for reaching high numbers with Rainbow Force. And of course, it means we can do the one hit KO tricks with Bisharp, which is also very deadly. Finally, we're just going to play four double colorless and eight fairy. Eight gives us reasonable odds of hitting uh, Max Elixirs. The Super Odd as well can help that out later down the line. So fairly content with that and of course we need dc to energy drive rainbow force and psychic in general so pretty good stuff overall uh, there aren't too many rooms of flexibility for this deck i think one cool one is uh if i can spell marshall gx there we go um he's a fighting type which is actually one of the few types that we don't have in our list um and he can with his shadow hunt ability copy the attacks of um Xerneas, and this again can be helpful. As I've mentioned earlier, typically you'll try and fill the board with as many types as possible. So you really only have one Xerneas active, one on the bench. Well, if you play Marshadow, now you can much more comfortably have Xerneas active, Xerneas bench, and a Marshadow, which means in theory you have like more Xerneas style attackers 
in play at once, which gives you more elixir targets, a better place to put your EXP shares and choice bands. It lets you be a little bit more aggressive with your hand as well. So it's a cool option. Um, the reason I'm not playing it, weak to psychic and ability lock is everywhere right now. So I'm not a huge fan of the Marshadow, but I can see the reason why some people would go for that. Um, the only other card I would hugely consider is Field Blower. It's a bit greedy of me for not playing Field Blower currently. Um, because activating, or sorry, deactivating Garbatoxin, giving us back our Wonder Tag and our Instruct might be important for closing out the game against some of these um, Garbador variants. Uh, but at the moment, I think it's just kind of a too cute type card. You need to hit it at the right times, especially if you play one of. Um, if you're being end to like one or two cards, you have to hit the field blower. You may as well just up your Guzma count or Lily count, which I ended up choosing to do because those are the cards that you're trying to find when you're being end. Blower would give you instruct, but you know, you're still not 100% to hit those cards. We're just giving ourselves the best chance of end proofing by having the highest counts possible. I think that's a more solid approach to go for than field blower. Especially because we only really need abilities on the opening turns for Bridget plays or for uh, Sycamore Lily plays, stuff like that. So, yeah, I think Blower's a bit too cute. If you're only going to play one, it's a lot less consistent. So, that's why I've not gone for those. That is going to be it for the um, card choices. As, as I've said, there are plenty of Pokemon out there that you could go for. Um, but I feel like the list right now is kind of tight. I think... If anything else, I try and work in spaces for like EXP shares. Maybe a special charge is an interesting one. Uh, but really, that's about it. I think um, it's as bare bones as it can be to be consistent. So let's see how we do in the field of battle. We are always looking to find uh, EX and GX based decks and hoping to uptrade two for ones against them. So let's see how that strategy goes. We do lead off with a... Lele, which is far from ideal because it basically means we can't use a Wonder Tag based... Well, it depends how much HP our opponent's active Pokemon have, but... Looks like we're up against a ho -Oh Salazzle, or at least a Fire Archetype. We will immediately go for the Nest Ball Finder Xerneas because that is the integral moment right here. We do have both of our dual typers in play, or accessible to us. We have Volk as well, and even a Ranguru, so this is going to be a good start from us. We can go for a Max Elixir here. That hits, which is awesome. I'm going to attach an Energy Active so we can move very consistently. Although we have the Guzma available, I'm considering the Lily because it is going to get us uh, five cards. Sycamore will get us seven, but it does burn resources. Hmm. Let's have a think about this. Uh, with this deck, more cards equals more cards. And in general, you'd want to take the more cards route. Uh, we have unfortunately got ourselves into a supporterless hand. Um, so we're just going to have to pass it here. It's not terrible though. We still are dealing 3, 6, 9, 100 damage next turn. It's not great, but we'll see what our opponent can come up with. No N, unfortunately. So just going to see the Sycamore from the opponent. They currently don't have any other benched Pokemon. Looks like they're playing Gumshoes as well, which is crazy. There's a Ho-Oh. We're much less scared of Ho-Oh when they don't use Kiawe on turn one. They had the Kiawe, but just no valid target to put it onto. Going to see an Ultra Ball as well. For more Pokemon, it looks like. Them attaching to Salandit means they might well have to retreat here. Because of our attachment to Lele. They're going to go for a Young Goose. Slap that down. Go for a Super Rod as well. Getting back some of those Fire Energies and Gumshoes. And it goes over to us. Uh, we'll just uh, deal with this Salandit. Probably our best line. Protect Xerneas and take a prize in the process. In theory, they could go Gumshoes Energy Choice Band. Not hugely scared by that. Wow, they just scoop. Yeah, early pressure's pretty good. Early pressure's pretty good. Pretty sure they had to hit Gumshoe's Choice Band to be in that game. I mean, they, they didn't know how bad our hand was, but we did take a Lily off the prizes at least. We couldn't lower hand size by much, but we could have drawn a couple of cards there. And we were still under no threat for that turn, so... Let's get another game in. 
Uh, we start with Joltik, which is actually our ideal lead. And we're going to see a mulligan here from the opponent also. Looks like it's another fire archetype. Grabbing Floatstone really is a dead card. They're going to get to go first. They have the Ho-Oh, -Oh, so are they going to be able to manage a Kiawe? <clears throat> if so, well, there's a Lele, so that's probably the answer. We can only draw a couple cards off Lily here. Hmm. They get an attachment and an elixir as well, so six energy into play turn one. Not too shabby. And they pass it over to us, of course. Kuzma isn't helpful. So we do this. Do this. Three cards. It's a big three. Well, there's a Pokemon in there, which is very good. We're just going to try and hide. Uh, we should play as many cards as possible, actually, just to uh, lower the hand size for Lily next turn. Okay. See another attachment and a sycamore. Two Guzmas go in the bin. So they chose not to deal with. Well, he could still deal with Doltic actually. But yeah, I'll just ping the Doltic. So Ponyard Bishop can actually do a decent chunk to this guy now. And N is pretty tempting. Let's get back Joltik and energy. I think I will attach, it's our best bet here. So Lily draws three, so we'll just end instead. Much more higher odds of hitting what we'd like. Well, we get Bishop and basic Pokemon, so there's not much else we can ask for, really. So we, if we have a Ranguru here, we may have to go for a Bridget play. No, 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 no. Next turn we need DC on the Lele. Yeah, we have to go this way around. We'll have to like hope to Elixir later on. So we'll go for Retaliate, one twenty. The best news is he's put energies onto a Lele, and that's far less threatening than like a Turtonator or something like that. Unless he scorched her from them. A Guzma play here would be quite upsetting if they Guzma Lele. Gonna see an attachment continuing on this Tapu Lele. They're gonna find themselves a flat a Salandit. And Sycamore once again. There's a payment of retreat, which is wild. Trying to protect the Ho-Oh. -Oh. The elixir back onto it. Six, eight, 10, 12, 15, that's no good. We still have float stones in the deck if we want to go for Volk. Let's promote Volk here. We could still top deck a DC and just deal with the Ho-Oh. -Oh. Well, that's what happened. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. How many choice bands have they committed? Only one. They'd have to commit one more energy. Oh, man. I think we have to. Uh, taking risks. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Don't have to commit anything else. Let's just do it. Mm. Man, this doesn't feel great. It's funny that we had that option though. <laughs> we opened up the option for ourselves. So 10, 12, so we need to attach an extra time to the Lele and find a choice band. We've gone through seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. They've gone through 12 energies now, geez. How many more do they have? Don't have to go for a Nitro Tank turn. Typically these sorts of decks play 13, 14. So if you can't find choice man energy 
And they've already got rid of one, bear in mind. This could be really risky from them. Oh, wow, they have energy. So they're digging for choice. Well, there you go. Crazy. So we need a pretty big turn here. I think we need Elixir help. <laughs> Three, six, nine, ten, eleven. We need Choice Ban. No, we need DC, Elixir, Floatstone, and then just Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon. <laughs> oh man. Okay, let's see what happens. Well, we got pretty close. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Oh man. Well, okay. I guess we could have gone for like a greedy Ultra Ball Instruct type approach, but I think that's surely too greedy. I'm gonna grab themselves another Salazzle, it looks like. Oh, they're just gonna grab Lele. Hmm. Interesting. Just thinning everything that he can. They're gonna play Guzma, deal with Arzonius. The good news is we haven't played any Elixir. Oh, we played one Elixir. The good news is we have three Elixirs left. Okay. Oh, that's another Ultra Ball. That's pretty bad for us, huh? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 17. How many choice bands do we have left? None. Okay. So we can't go for a Lele approach. We have to go for the Elixir line. have no Lele either. So that's pretty bad. We have to get pretty lucky here, not gonna lie. Oh, no. oh the joys of only playing two Lele. We can uh, thin our hand size as much as possible to hope that he doesn't have another Guzma. I think they've gone through three. Oh, they've gone through four. Okay, we're actually fine. We're not fine. We're not good here. If he Nitro tanks, it's going to be really bad for us. Probably game if he Nitro tanks correctly. I'm going to super in some energies. Still plenty in there. They also have Max Elixir. <clears throat> they can actually dig for the knockout now. Going to end. <laughs> well, they had a Rangaroo, but that's still just funny. Okay. Well, that's what happens when it can go aggressive. Hmm. We didn't really get going there. Let's try again. One more game with, Z with Xerneas. <laughs> we faced two fire decks. Did we go second in both occasions? We did, right? Kiawe decks are so much better. Like, their win rate is so much higher when they go first. That's always something you have to remember. In a better free situation, I feel like we'd be much safer. <clears throat> they went pretty YOLO as well. All right, we do get to go first this time, which is nice. And we have decent hand here, for sure. It's going to be an instruct for three cards if we Bridget attach Elixir. Tapu Coco. Hmm. Coco isn't in every deck. A 
it also makes us worried about if we get Joltik out here or not. We have both our Lele's. I think I just go double Xerneas. Hmm. Although he probably won't get two flying flips up against us. It does mean that Ultra Balls then become an out for Lele. I think this is fine. Whiffing Elixir is a little bit sad. Committing Floatstone is fine. Committing Floatstone is fine. Let's get a couple of instructs in there. Oranguru is such a champion. Well, we kept the slot open for Lele, but now we don't have to use it because we also got a supporter. Um, and real men retreat in these spots. Pretty confident Xerneas won't get too heavily battered. If he wants to go for an energy drive, he's feeding us two prizes. So We'll learn a little bit more about our opponent's deck now. Both of our floatstones being commit quite early here, but you do have the four Guzma, so in theory, stall shouldn't be too bad for us. Looks like it's a straight Glissopod list. Straight pod is probably easier for us than a Garb Glissopod. So that's good news. We will just sycamore this hand. Missing DC is sadness. Hmm. Uh, this is better. Let's improve our odds. We still have a one card instruct for the DCE dream. Never DCE. We're not actually in too bad of a shape. If he takes the knockout with a Glissopod, we're actually fine. As long as we can KO it the next turn. We have 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. We can go uh, 16, we can go 190 with the Ultra Ball. Sycamore hope to find um, one more bench Pokemon, like a Joltik or Volk. So we could still be fine here. It is a shame that we can't take a prize, but you know, at the end of the day, we can still just take all two prizes in this matchup. Glissopod, his only real attacker. We should be fine. More Wimpods hit the bench. Do we have any more attachments this turn? See a choice band, sure. And just going to be the first impression, it looks like. So we're at 160 on board. And then we'll go to 190 with this Ultra Ball. Always important to get your Xerneas. Make sure you have a good, healthy number of them. Let's go for two cards first. It's a little bit greedy. But we need to hit a lot here. Uh, those are definitely two cards we don't want. We can't put the Lele down because we already have a Psychic type and we need more damage this turn. Again, it's a whiff of DCE. Ah. Well, that hurts. That definitely hurts. Hmm. 
I want to protect Guru. He's better than Bishop in the matchup, so we'll just go for this. If they do have Guzma, it is a little bit more sad for us. We'd have to hit um, Elixir DC again. And we've got through two Elixirs. We can thin our hand quite nicely next turn, and Lily up to six probably, if he takes the knockout here. Actually, if they take the knockout anywhere, we can lily up to six with our hand. There is the Guzma. It's definitely the optimal play, so I don't, I'm not surprised that they go for it. And we're again in that awkward spot. Ugh, Xerneas proving its fragilities. So I've said earlier that it's a rogue deck. Revisiting it, I personally am not a fan of the deck, but there we go. We're demonstrating why it's not tier one. That's what we're doing right now. Okay. Let's go for it. Oh, the Lily top deck means we can't go for the six card draw. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen. So we're already at two ten. We'll put the Joltic uh, no we won't, will we? No, we should go for N instead. We draw more cards this way. Plus we re-establish the Xerneas, which is going to be important. Two elixirs. Come on. Two energy in deck. This is not great odds. Uh, uh, uh. Come on. We've missed DC all game. Uh, missed the elixir. Oh, the hype. Unfortunately, the nature of this deck, we just have to hope they don't have Guzma. It sounds like a terrible plan, but it's the only plan we have. Let's pass. Field blower. Oh, he got rid of the choice band, which means we probably survive. Remarkable. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, uh, two, ten. Sorry, yeah, eighteen to ten to twenty. Oh, they do. Okay, they were thinking their hand. Oh, it looks like they're going to GX attack. Okay. Bad news again for us. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, two, ten with a choice band, but two ten doesn't matter this turn because we can't Guzma. I could Lele, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, nineteen. No. Hmm. This is very bad. Looks like it just took us too many turns to get there. Pretty sure we're done. Uh, because we can't Guzma. Is Guzma stall our play at this point? I guess Lele attack is our best move. Try and tank with Lele for a turn. It's a horrible move, but it's our best move. Uh, we'll get back these. And we'll just get a new hand. Pro Town coming into play. With a cheeky elixir. We need to retain damage.
Hmm. If they basically have another Guzma, they win like every single time here. The hand size is high. This pod typically plays four copies. So pretty much resigned to a loss here. Ah, DC is fine on the active. I don't mind that. Ah, okay, I see. He's doing the 150. <laughs> so I have to do the Coco. Otherwise I lose. Yeah, it's game in so many ways here. Uh, we can't Guzma the Coco and KO it without the Lele. So that's game in every which way you look at it. Very good. Very good. So there is Xerneas Break. Proof that it is still rogue tier. Uh, not Xerneas Break, what am I saying? Rainbow Force. Yeah, proving itself to be rogue tier still. Um, Basically, there was some hype around it. There were some articles being written. I think the Charles Art Lounge wrote an article about saying why it's good, and I'm pretty convinced that it's still not good. <laughs> there we go. Games prove that, and not every deck that I show is going to be top tier and the best out there. I try and provide all sorts of different content for you guys, and there was a few requests for Rainbow Force because it was an interesting one. So there we go. That's my take on it. It really didn't perform very well. Maybe the Lilies were a bit underwhelming as well. Maybe there should be a higher split of N. Uh, but really that's because we were going down in prizes because we were drawing so badly but you know that's the way it goes so maybe the deck could be simplified further what do you think about the list and uh, what do you think about Xerneas in general is it just uh, some people going for it and getting lucky and sleeping through the net and finding the right matchups in fairness um, this pod definitely one of the harder ones um, you can just sort of steamroll it if you can chain Xerneas but we really struggle to do that and also, um, Kiawe Ho'o, much harder when they get the turn on Kiawe and go first and all that good stuff. And again, we didn't really get much going our own end. So plenty of complaints and suboptimal draws and all that jazz uh, leading to some of those losses. So maybe it's variance. Maybe just with more games, this deck will prove itself to still be a powerhouse. Who knows? Let me hear it all in the discussion down below. And uh, we'll be back with more deck videos soon. So don't go anywhere. Thanks so much for watching. Cheers.